Okay, great. Thank you, Loretta. I um, hope the um, audio is good. And now uh, we'll get started by me sharing my screen. If you have any questions during uh, the class, do let me know. Um, okay, thank you, Lewis. And I'm gonna pull up my mind map. And we will get started. Okay, move a couple things around here on my screen. And let's see. Not seeing the list of people on my screen. Um, okay, there we go. I see Christopher just joined us. Welcome, Christopher. Great. All right. So I'm assuming everyone can see my screen. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. And if you have any questions, uh, do let me know. And let me move this around so we have the screen a little bit bigger. All right. Well, welcome to uh, tonight's class. And I hope everyone is doing well in these crazy times. Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about traditional methods of food preparation. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of people have this notion that somehow modern technology and modern science has, has superseded all of the knowledge of ancient history. And what we'll see by what my goal is for this lecture is by the end of this lecture for you to understand that the wisdom of people of the past is vitally important for us today. Now we may be able to explain some of these things a whole lot better than they did in the past, but it actually doesn't mean that there are things from cultural traditions and practices that are even more sometimes vitally important for your health. It's important for you to, uh, to in integrate or to understand these things so you have a better understanding of, of eating plants, basically, because we know that really the more plants that you can eat, generally speaking, the better. But plants aren't always healthy for you. They can make you sick. And they are designed, in fact, some plants to make you sick. I mean, plants don't wanna be eaten necessarily any more than an animal does. And the way they get around that is they develop chemical defenses. And these chemical defenses are designed to make you, partially designed to make you sick so that you won't eat them. But human ingenuity, cultural experience that's passed on from generation to generation has allowed people to understand these, these poisons basically and to get around them. You'll see, I guarantee you by the end of this lecture that you're going to find certain things in your diet that perhaps you're not following sort of an ancient cultural tradition that is probably not helpful for you. I'll give you one example, eating a huge kale salad. These kale salads, kale has certain chemicals in it that can affect your thyroid. We'll get into that throughout uh, as we get into the lecture. But I, as I said, I guarantee you by the end of this lecture, there are going to be things that you are going to recognize that perhaps that's why you don't like a certain food. Maybe it's because you don't feel well with it. It's not uncommon for me to talk to people who are trying to be vegan. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. If you, can, you can be a very, very healthy vegan. But if you don't understand the traditional methods of preparing plants, then you are missing out and you're not going to be a thriving vegan. But pushing veganism aside, even if you're an omnivore and you're eating meat and vegetables, it still is important for you to understand that getting a, cl a clear grasp of how to make the foods that you eat the most digestible and have the most nutrients is to understand how to make them, how to prepare them in ways so that you get more nutrients, that the nutrients aren't locked up, that the chemical poisons that are in these plants are not holding on to vital minerals. And really, a lot of the things we're going to talk about as we go through this lecture is understanding that minerals which many of us are deficient in, like zinc, 
are often bound up by some of the things that we're going to be talking today. And now we're in a crisis, and this crisis is based on, you know, you want to have the best immune system. And for this particular condition and viruses in general, it's important to have zinc in your diet. And you don't need a lot of zinc, but a lot of the not, if you don't pay attention to traditional means of processing plants, the zinc that you would be getting in your food might just be bound up and being passed right through you. And we should make sure that we get enough zinc in our diets during this crisis that we're in. So that's a sort of added additional thing. So let's get into the, I see we have uh, some other people who have come in. Uh, hello, uh, looks like Vicky, welcome. And again, if anyone has any questions, do let me know. So I wanted to start tonight's lecture um, with a story, and that's a story of Robert Burke. Now, Robert Burke was one of the first European explorers to go across um, Australia. And what happened with him is sort of a lesson of cultural knowledge that was sort of disregarded. And I would say that the same sort of cultural dis disregarding that he did is often something that, that we do as modern people where we sort of ignore the traditional means of preparation. So as I said, he led the first European expedition across Australia and he was with two other explorers and they became stranded, they ran out of food. A local tribe was kind to them and gave them these crushed seed pods from a fern called the Nardu, uh, unfortunately. And so they were, they now had food. Unfortunately, they got into a fight with the local tribe and they thought, well, we have all this food here. At the time, they were totally starving. They didn't realize there was any food around, but they were taught by the local tribe that this, they made these cakes from, from these seeds of the fern. So they said, well, we got into a fight and we're not gonna listen to them anymore. We have food, we'll survive. Well, it turned out that in two weeks, he and his partner were dead. And the third one, the third part, the third explorer begged for help with the, to the local tribe and they gave him food and he survived. Now, what happened here? It was the same seeds, but the local tribe, the Yan, Yandru Wanda, uh, they roasted the, the, the spores from the fern. They ground them into a flour. They exposed the, cake, the cakes to ash, which amazingly, this is a very basic solution that's also used in, in processing corn. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And each step got rid of something called thiaminase, which got rid of thiamine, which is vitamin B1. And this is obviously uh, not something that one learns by chance. This was something that was passed down through these tribes to be able to survive on this particular food. And this is sort of the cardinal example of cultural transmission of foods, of pr preparation of foods. Believe it or not, cassava, which is very common today, you see cassava chips, cassava flour, is actually also quite toxic. It requires very tedious and a very complex preparation ritual because otherwise it releases cyanide. Just your good old fashioned cassava, which is a staple food in many areas of the world. And there's no doubt that there have been plenty of poisonings by people who brushed the process of processing cassava. In South America, where humans have eaten cassava for thousands of years, again, the tr tribes have learned the many steps to detoxify it. Scraping, grating, washing, boiling, leaving the salad to stand for two days, and then baking. And we're gonna go through just very traditional techniques that all of you are probably aware of, but maybe not Maybe you don't have a context for how it is impactful in your life. Now we buy food at the store and we think, well, it's gonna be safe. Well, raw beans are very, very toxic as an example, but we're going to be talking a little bit about the subtle things that could potentially be making you feel a little bit sick, um, but more importantly, teaching you the basics so that you can eat as many plants as possible because that's going to yield the best, the best health. 
So let's go into basic concepts and just to outline what we're going to be talking about here. It's not going to be a mystery, really. Uh, we'll talk about basic concepts. We'll talk about what, what heat does, what mechanical processing does, what soaking does, uh, what fermentation does, what germination, malting, and sprouting does, and then how and why it's important to combine some of these for, for, for optimal nutrition. Uh, and I would just say, remember, the point here is, is to never forget that plants have an enormous amount of plant defenses. And as, as has been described in, in many other books, that animals have the capability to run away from a predator. A plant is just sitting there. And as a result of that, instead of learning to run away, it's become a chemist. Plants have become these elaborate chemists. And they've been able to develop all kinds of different chemicals to prevent us from eating them. And these processes are designed to be able to, to clear that away so that we can enjoy plants. So let's talk about basic concepts. So these are the basic, what are called anti-nutrients. Uh, there's goitrogens, which are basically substances that disrupt the production of thyroid hormones by interfering with iodine uptake. So they block iodine from getting into your thyroid gland. And this triggers the pituitary to up your TSH, which all of you probably are, have remembered that you, know, you often get that as a standard blood test. And when that happens, that promotes growth of thyroid tissue. And that leads to goiter. Remember those, those people uh, who, who used to have big, big thyroids. But on top of that, not just talking about goiter, you're still, even if you don't have a profound clinical goiter, you can still have thyroid interfering chemicals that are in your, in, that you're eating that's going to, to in, interfere with your thyroid, which means that if any of you have some sort of thyroid condition, then, and it's uncontrolled or you really want to get a handle of it, it's important to have some sort of idea about goitrogens. And we'll talk about that, but here are some of the goitrogens. Now keep in mind that this, these cause a problem when they are eaten raw. So we have uh, bok choy, broccoli, basically the cruciferous vegetables, uh, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, canola, cauliflower, Chinese cabbage, um, collard greens, horseradish, kale, kohlrabi, mizuna greens, mustard greens, radishes, uh, rapini, rutabagas, turnips, these are high in goitrogens. So if you're eating a big, huge cabbage salad, which I like, I like cabbage salads, but I, I am conscious of the fact that eating a humongous cabbage salad is not going to be the best thing. Now, how do we enjoy these? Well, that's what we're talking about tonight. We obviously, if you heat these, you're, you're essentially inactivating the, goitro the goitrogens. So we're talking mainly, uh, these are a problem if you're eating large quantities, depends on the person, of course, different people's level of response to goitrogens is gonna be different. Just keep in mind that all of these are essentially going to interfere with your, um, your, your thyroid. See, we have a couple other people uh, who came in. Hi, Paula, hi, David, welcome. Okay, the next one, so we have goitrogens. We have something called phytate, phytic acid. Now this inhibits iron, zinc, and calcium absorption, which means that it's binding, it's basically binding these, these critical elements, minerals, um, from getting into our food, getting into our bodies. So this is essentially in grains, nuts, and beans. And we'll talk about how to make beans the most digestible as possible, as well as nuts and grains. Then there's the thiaminase, which we just spoke about in, in the story of Robert Burke. Uh, then we have oxalates. So oxalates are uh, basically bind uh, iron and calcium. Of course, many of you have heard of oxalic stones, kidney stones. So some people who are predisposed to getting this particular type of, of, of calcium oxalate stones uh, are going to want to reduce the amount of oxalate-containing foods. 
And there are other people who, th who have hypothesized that having high oxalates can affect other, other diseases. We're not going to get into that. I haven't done a full literature search on that. I, don't, I tend to not think it's as huge a problem as some people are making it out to be. Nonetheless, um, we want to be conscious of, of, we certainly want to be conscious of not eating a huge amount of oxalates. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's going to affect your iron and calcium absorption. So spinach, as an example, there are lots of foods um, that have oxalates, beans, beer, beets, berries, chocolate, coffee, cranberries, dark green vegetables, uh, especially spinach, nuts, oranges, rhubarb, uh, soda, soybeans, soy milk. Now keep in mind uh, that tea as well has, has, uh, has oxalates. Now keep in mind, these are a lot of things. It just means raw. You, we are learning that you need to inactivate these things. So if you're in the habit of eating huge amounts of raw spinach salads, that potentially could be a problem. And for people who are hypersensitive to oxalates or oxalate so stones, they generally avoid spinach, even if it's cooked. So, um, so there's oxalates. Then there are lectins. Now lectins basically are, they are, they, they are a carbohydrate binder that actually binds to your intestinal wall. And they have been in news fairly frequently uh, due to a, a book called The Plant Paradox. Um, and for some people, they get sick from these lectins. And those, a lot of people with autoimmune disease potentially can have a more of a susceptibility to lectins or people who are having gut issues to begin with, these are gut irritants. So for those people who are trying to get their guts in order, you wanna make sure that you are inactivating lectins or avoiding foods that have lectins in them. And we'll get into both of those, how to get, how to get rid of them. Obviously it's bean, beans and nightshade plants have, have lectins um, and then how to inactivate them. And we'll get into that as well. Um, just doing a time check here, one moment, okay. So let's get into our first way of inactivating some of these things. And of course it's heat. So um, when you heat things, both the goitrogens and the thiaminases are broken down. However, when we're talking about phytic acid, right? We spoke about phytic acid here, um, inhibiting iron, zinc, and calcium. Heating is not going to be as effective a technique as as getting rid of the goitrogens by heating. Uh, when you heat things, you also increase what's called the bioavailability. That basically means the amount that you are able to absorb. So it's increasing the bioavailability of, of thiamine, B1, B6, niacin, B3, folate, carotenoids, uh, because it's releasing them from being bound inside of the plant. But also, as you've all heard, that you know, when you overboil something, you're also as an example, if you're boiling it, you're also gonna lose a lot of water-soluble nutrients like vitamin C and, and riboflavin and a whole host of other things. So while you're increasing the bioavailability, absorption of various vitamins, you're also losing some of them as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance here, it's a trade-off essentially um, for, for some plants. Now, pressure cooking, which is another form of heat with under pressure, and of course, many of you, uh, including myself, have a instant pot, which is a very, very popular thing that many people have, which is a pressure cooker, is going to inactivate the lectins. Um, and so one of the things that you need to keep in mind when we're talking about heating is, is this trade-off. Now, how do we make the most of the trade-off of heating and cooking vegetables? Because that's really what we're talking about. The way you do that is you eat half of your vegetables raw and half of them cooked. But you choose, obviously, vegetables that are not goitrogens. You don't eat a huge kale salad. You have a salad made of le chopped lettuce. Different, and the lettuce family has so many different lettuces. Um, and in general, just to balance things off, if, if you're eat, you know, I recommend people eat a, a lot of green leafy greens per day, then you know, you're gonna wanna do 
if, if those greens have goitrogens, if you want to add spinach to your diet, then you're going to cook that. And the lettuces you're going to have, have raw. It's a whole host of, so you want half raw, half cooked. And that's how you should sort of think about maximizing leafy green vegetables. Don't think that by cooking it, you are inactivating everything. Um, I wouldn't, you know, that's not a scent, that's not what happens. So uh, let me just turn off my, make sure we don't get interfered with here. One moment. I've always, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people who they just sort of think that everything has to be raw. And for a long time, there were many people who were raw vegans and they were just eating raw vegetables. And that is completely inconsistent. And somewhat, I, you know, it's like, it's naive almost because cultures around the world have figured out that just eating raw vegetables is not safe. So, so just, just bear in mind that again, when you're cooking vegetables, you're not necessarily decreasing the nutrients. As I said here, there are many, many nutrients in vegetables that are activated, that are, their bioavailability is increased by heating. So again, you want half raw, half cooked, and then you cover your bases. Okay, let's now go to mechanical processing. So that is essentially, historically speaking, pounding and removing the bran or, or the germ from cereals. And that basically reduces the phytate. And this is in from rice, sorghum, wheat, you know, the germ, the outer layer of the, of the, of the corn. These are loaded. These sort of, uh, the bran and the germ are loaded with these chemicals to prevent them from essentially being eaten. In other words, it's preventing them um, from, the, you know, they basically are, they want to they get into the ground and they want to germinate. So it's preventing that from, from basically happening. Now, when you just pound, you do get an increase in the bioavailability of iron, zinc, and calcium, but there are nutrients in, by, by removing the, the bran and germ, you know, you're also getting rid of nutrients that are in the bran or the germ. I mean, everyone tends to think, right, that brown rice or uh, whole wheat are somehow healthier but if you're getting all of the, the unprocessed outer layer, then it's, it's actually not, it's gonna have a lot of phytic acid and a lot of people are gonna have problems digesting it. As an example, in Japan, it's very rare for people to eat brown rice. I mean, if you think about that, why is that? It's, it's because if you have millions of people eating large quantities of brown rice, you're going to have people who are not going to be able to digest it. It's, it's going to make people sick. Now, you can find brown rice in Japan, but it's, it's eaten in very small, small portions. So, um, cult, so as a culture, Asian culture has sort, of, has sort of determined on its own that no one eats large quantities of, of brown rice. The same thing goes with sort of whole wheat. Whole wheat, again, if it's not processed correctly, um, then you're also going to have some, some problems. So how do, we, how do we get to a place where we can actually eat whole wheat and brown rice and those sorts of things? Well, we're going to talk about that uh, as we go through, go through the class. Uh, so what about vegetables? In other words, what about pounding or chopping vegetables? Well, in this case, you're releasing things that may have been bound up in the fiber. So, it's, it's, so you increase the bioavailability of vegetables when you are chopping them. Now, one of the most amazing things is cruciferous vegetables like, like broccoli, um, cauliflower, collards, um, uh, mustard greens, all of these are in this, this uh, family of cruciferous vegetables. What's amazing about that is that you actually have to chop the vegetable to get the beneficial ingredients. Because there's ama amazingly, there's one chemical in the cell wall and then another chemical inside the cell. And you need to crush it 
to make the, this really, an, really potent anti-cancer chemical. And so by crushing it, you can actually form this chemical, which means remarkably with cruciferous vegetables that if you chop them really finely and you let them, you sort of mix them and let them sit for you know, five or 10 minutes, you get an enormous amount of this chemical. And then at that point, you can actually heat it. And that particular anti-cancer chemical uh, stays. So you can end up making soups, leafy green soups with cruciferous vegetables that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat raw, but still get the anti-cancer benefit by chopping it finely, uh, making it into, uh, mixing it up into say, putting it in an in a instant pot or a slow cooker. And because you've chopped it up finely, you've gotten the anti-cancer chemical. It's in there, it's gonna stay in there. It's not gonna be inactivated by the heat. Um, so in this case, you're getting the best of, of, of essentially best of raw and cooked with when you work with cruciferous vegetables in this way. Okay, let's move on to, uh, to soaking. So for cereal grains and beans, some of the phytic acid, some of the phytate can be removed by soaking um, and, then, and then decanting. Uh, this was traditionally done, but then you also lose some polyphenols, um, but, uh, but you also get rid of some uh, oxalates. So generally speaking, soaking is usually combined with something else. Now there's something called nixtamalization, which is a process for preparation of corn um, used in, in, in Mexico. They've done this for, for centuries, you know, who knows how long, I mean, could be thousands of years, where basically the corn is soaked and then it's cooked in an alkaline solution. We spoke about that a little bit with the cassava, usually lime water. And um, the lime water is an alkaline solution. It's then washed and then hulled. And this, may, this liberates um, the B vitamins in, in there. So before they were doing this, and even in recent history, when they didn't follow the normal process, people were getting B vitamin deficiencies because they weren't soaking the, the um, corn in this lime water. Now, how remarkable is that, that, that human, humanity in general came up with this? Because you think about when they, when they developed this, I mean, they didn't know what a B vitamin was, but they knew that people weren't getting sick. They knew that people were thriving. When they were, they knew that they needed to do something to it. So we should always recognize that that although the terminology and the science might not have been precise or they wouldn't be able to explain it in modern terms, there is a certain level of genius that develops over generation after generation of learning to survive. And nixtamalization is, is, another, is another situation. Now, as many of you know, I'm the uh, president and founder of Miracle Noodle and Miracle Noodle is, is, is sort of another process of nixtamalization because it's traditionally the flour is soaked in, in lime water, which basically allows the, the soluble fiber to coagulate to be able to make the noodles. And oftentimes we'll get questions from people and they'll say, why is there lime water? Why is there lime water in this? I mean, that sounds so modern and toxic. And I, I have to explain that these are techniques of increasing the ability to enjoy foods that, are, that go back th literally thousands of years. In the case of Miracle Noodles, using lime water to, to make this product literally goes back over a thousand years uh, to the Buddhist monks that developed the product. And we just underestimate the, the knowledge and the uh, genius of, of people of the past. And we do so at, a, at our own um, risk, really. Okay, so we covered soaking. We've covered uh, mechanical processing. We've covered heat and pressure cooking. Uh, I th pressure cooking, which I basically it destroys lectins. I, didn't, I don't think I ended up uh, saying that formally. So if you're interested in incorporating beans back into your diet, then just pressure cook them. If, if you have trouble digesting, many people have trouble digesting beans. So there are, there are ways of increasing the digestibility that, and then there's ways of slowly incorporating them into your diet. 
Now, sometimes it has something to do with the gut bacteria. You might not have a broad diversity that allows you to digest many, many, many different things. But on the other hand, it could be that you are sensitive to lectins. So if you want to incorporate beans, and really it's, it is important to incorporate some beans into your diet. I mean, they are a food that is almost more associated with health and longevity than any sort of single food. Not saying you need to eat a can of beans a day, but it, I believe it is important to have some amount of beans. And if you're not, ha not a billet, let's say you get gassy or whatever it may be. Well, the first thing to do is to have a small amount, try pressure cooking them, eating a very, very small amount, and slowly increasing the amount of beans very, very slowly over time, but with pressure cooked beans. Now you get rid of a lot of the lectins when you are um, soaking beans. That is true. So a lot of people who are saying, well, you don't have to pressure cook, you really get rid of the majority of them if you, if you pressure cook them. You render beans safe by soaking because you're getting rid of all these things. We've sort of gone through some of that and, co and cooking as well. So there's soaking and there's cooking with beans. You get rid of most of the top, most of the lectins. But if you want a superior digestive experience, if I could phrase it that way, without all the mess that sometimes beans cause for some people, you're going to want to pressure cook them. Okay, so let's move over here to fermentation. Now we all know about fermentation for the most part. Um, there is lots of things that are fermented. So sauerkraut as an example. Um, now the beneficial bacteria, let's just, because people tend to think of sauerkraut as fermented vegetable, realize that you're basically getting a phytate hydrolysis from the beneficial bacteria, which basically means it's splitting apart phytic acid, may, rendering it inactive. Um, so by fermentation, as an example, 90% of the phytate can be removed from, from maize, from soybean. So as an example, there's in Japanese culture, there's something called natto, which is a fermented soybean. And a lot of people are not in favor of eating a lot of raw, or I should say unfermented soy products for lots of different reasons, one of which is this phytate. Well, you can have it fermented. So we've learned, cultures have learned, like the Japanese have learned, that by fermenting the soy, it makes it very digestible and incredibly healthy. Sorghum flour, uh, cassava, lima beans, and many others by fermentation is going to inactivate the phytate and make it more digestible. Now, any vegetable can be fermented. Just doing a time check. Literally any vegetable can be fermented. And what's amazing and miraculous to me is that if you buy an organic cabbage at the store, well, where, where is the bacteria coming from? I mean, you chop it up, and I have a video on my YouTube channel on how to make sauerkraut and my Facebook page. Where is this bacteria coming from that is so amazingly effective at getting rid of, of phytic acid and all these other things? It's residing right on the vegetable. It's like there already. There's lactic acid forming bacteria, lactobacillus, that actually lives on on the, on, the, on the leaves. I mean, to me, that, again, is another one of these miraculous things. I mean, it's, it's ready to go to ferment. You just need to add water and uh, you just need to pound it, add a little water and salt, essentially, and it will ferment. It will preserve the product. Now, we spoke, remember, we spoke over here about these in basic concepts, right, about, um, about goitrogens. And we spoke about how cabbage is one of those with goitrogens. Well, with fermentation, you're also getting rid of the goitrogens. So you're getting rid of the goitrogens, you're getting rid of the phytate, you're making it incredibly digestible. And the bacteria that's, that is there for it to do that are, is ready to go. And as I said, you can ferment just about anything. There's a great book, which I mentioned last week, um, and I'll just, I'll just 
you know, do it again, um, just so everyone can see this book. I mean, The Art of Fermentation, highly recommend it. Or any book to learn fermentation. I mean, you, any of you can learn how to do it. It's, it's incredibly easy for you to do. Um, amazing, amazingly, it also produces organic acids. So when you ferment the vegetable, during this process, uh, the bacteria are breaking down the vegetable. It releases acids, basically, that are going to enhance iron and zinc absorption. So we spoke about how important zinc is to all of us these days to keep our immune systems functioning properly and able to be able to ward off viruses. Well, you are going to get higher zinc absorption from, from fermentation. Very, very important. Let's talk about another fermentation that I didn't put here. Um, sourdough bread, traditional sourdough bread. Now, traditional sourdough bread is soured. That's why it's called sour, sourdough. It's soured, meaning it's fermented. It, it is made and then it's soured for, for multiple days. So it's basically fermenting for several days. And remarkably, what happens when you do this is that you end up with a high, easier to digest product. You're getting rid of even a lot of the gluten. I've, I've read a report that like if it's soured the way they used to sour it many, many years ago, not with the, in the you know, instant yeast, but the, the traditional slow, ferment, slow yeast and fermentation and the souring, that 99% of the gluten, can, it goes away. In addition to the fact that we are getting rid of the phytates that are found in cereal grains. So yet another amazing ancient technology for something that we are recognizing can be an issue for people. These instant rise breads are just really not good for you. And I think if you, if you wanted to have bread and you can find a local baker and support a local baker who makes traditional sourdough bread where they're literally souring it for several days, that is going to be a much better and healthier product for you, not just from the, from the perspective of phytate, which again is going to bind minerals, but also from a gluten perspective. And maybe you're not sensitive to gluten, but even if you're, you have to realize that the wheat that we have today has a lot more gluten in it than it did in the past. And gluten by itself can sometimes be a little bit irritating to, to the gut. So if you're focusing on just having the, the healthiest gut possible, and you don't want to get rid of bread, then a traditional sourdough is definitely something that, that you can, you can uh, do. Um, I see we have uh, some other people who have come in. Um, I think uh, Paula, I think you're, you're new, new in the class. Welcome. Well, you might have been in before. Maybe I'm just seeing the list. Okay, so now let's go over to germination, malting, sprouting. So when, you, when a seed starts to germinate, it, rele it releases phytase, which is basically going to get rid of the phytate and, and is going to allow the, the seed to actually germinate. So it, it releases what's called endogenous phytase, which basically means an enzyme from inside is going to break down the phytates. Um, germination of grains, beans, seeds, all of these are going to get rid of the phytic acid. For years ago, you know, sprouting was a very um, trendy sort of thing to do. And you really have to do a little bit of investigating. You can't just assume that sprouting everything is going to yield the best results. But uh, rice, millet, mung beans, you know, mung beans have always been a very, very popular bean to to uh, sprout, and I've certainly sprouted, uh, I've sprouted mung beans, I've sprouted uh, red lentils. Um, these things are, when you do that, you essentially are reducing the, the phytic acid, the phytate content. Um, and I'm trying to think of some other examples. Well, as an example, with grains, you know, you can buy sprouted, like um, 
I think Ezekiel bread is a sprouted grain. So these are also going to be more digestible where you have sprouted, sprouted wheat and sprouted millet. And I think that Ezekiel bread has a combination of millet and wheat, both of which are sprouted. And you're going to ha also have a more digestible e experience with that, with that bread as well. Okay. Um, sprouting is coming back I, again, I think. You know, um, there are lots of sprouting kits that you can buy. And um, one of the things that I like to do is, is make microgreens, which is essentially like sprouting, where you have, say, broccoli seed, you buy broccoli seeds, and there's a video on my YouTube page on, on how to do this. And honestly, you just sprinkle the seeds onto various different surfaces. Uh, you can use a thin layer of soil, or they have what are called sprouting mats. And in a, in a week, literally, you have a little sprout that grows up, you can cut it and you can make a salad out of these greens. And oftentimes the microgreens are so much more nutritious than the full plant because the, the, the plant, the seed is sprouting and it really is putting in all the enzymes possible to make this, this little plant grow. And so you get an enormous number of nutrients and you can buy mixed salad um, seeds and you just sprinkle them on, and literally within a week, you can have a salad of microgreens that is very, very delicious and incredibly healthy. Some people take the broccoli sprouts, which are, I don't remember the number, but it's like 200 times more nutrients than, than fully grown broccoli, and some people will lightly steam it to, as we said, uh, liberate some of the, the beneficial ingredients. So there's lots of things out there for sort of optimizing the nutrients and microgreens is just an incredible way of, of doing it. But ultimately, especially in areas of poverty, it's usually a combination of these things that, that takes place. So you have soaking of grains and fermenting of grains and sprouting of grains. All of these things happen to allow these things like, like grains and maize and beans to be more digestible bringing it back to a situation that we're in is to really, when it comes right down to it, um, is to make the foods that we may be avoiding completely to rethink them in a different way that maybe we just need to learn the wisdom of cultures of the past to really be able to incorporate these. So a lot of people have given up on beans. A lot of people have completely given up on grains. A lot of people have given up on seeds, sometimes nuts. Nuts should also be uh, soaked to make them more digestible. A lot of people have given up on these things. Um, and also, a lot of people have, with, have I, I idealized the raw vegetable. And we need to make sure that we understand that, that chopping and heating is going to increase the bioavailability. So... That is really what I wanted to cover. I didn't realize that, I didn't think we would actually make it this far in terms of 44 minutes. I thought it would turn out to be around a 30 minute uh, class. If any of you have any questions, I'm gonna go through some of this, just a brief summary. Um, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box. I don't see my chat box, let me pull that up. Um, okay, so if any of you have any questions, do let me know. I hope this gave you a different perspective on the foods that we eat, common foods that we eat. And sometimes the question that we often think about, we think about all these lectures and all these so-called gurus that are out there that are speaking about just going on a completely grain-free diet and, and getting rid of beans. And you think to yourself, people, humans have been eating beans as an example, and grains forever. And they, they weren't sick. They, there were cultures where they were thriving and they were thriving in an incredible way. So how is it that, how is it that all of a sudden that these things are just completely unhealthy for you? Not always, but almost always, the answer is, is it following the preparation instructions of the people of the past? And there are societies like the Weston Price Foundation, which I, I spoke of last week, that champions 
doing things in an ancestral way, learning and incorporating the techniques of, of the past. Um, so there are societies out there that you can, you can learn these sorts of, of things, learn how to do home fermentation, learn how to make your own bread, learn all of you, learn how to grow microgreens, practice soaking your nuts, you know, all these sorts of things. So, uh, so let's just briefly go through a review of what we said and then, and then we'll, I'll say goodnight. So we started out with the story of, of Robert Burke who basically learned a fatal lesson by not listening to the traditional methods of food preparation on the extreme level. But as we said, it's a whole scale from, you know, fatal to gut irritation when it comes to learning how to prepare plants. We went through basic concepts understanding goitrogens, things that interfere with the absorption of iodine, uh, and how you really need to cook certain vegetables. Phytate, which is being you know, found in, in seeds and beans that are, is going to inhibit and bind to iron, zinc, and calcium, how important it is for us to get calcium, so we should be conscious of phytic acid. A little phytic acid, of course, is, is, not, is not a danger. In fact, a little phytic acid has actually been shown to be a little beneficial, um, but we don't want to have phytic acid loaded foods in our diet. Thiaminases, which we spoke about in the story of, Bur of Robert Burke, oxalates, things like which have spinach can affect iron and calcium and for people can cause kidney stones, lectins we spoke about in beans. And then we jumped into uh, heating and how it's important to have half raw, half cooked. That would be my takeaway there as well as getting rid of some of those uh, goitrogens and thiaminases. We spoke about um, cutting and mechanical processing. For grains, it's not all that useful, but for things like vegetables to increase the bioavailability, it is certainly gonna be incredibly beneficial. Soaking, definitely for, for beans is going to get rid of, and, and grains, uh, we spoke about the very interesting nixtamalization, fermentation, which all of us should start to do in our homes and why and how it's so important and how it's just ready to go. And then germination with grains, beans and seeds, sprouting, sprouted bread, sprouted grains, sprouted breads, sprouted beans to, to, to make it home to eat and how they work and how really you're getting a combination of all these things, oftentimes soaking, sprouting, all these things sort of mixed together into a way to make your food more and easily digestible. So I hope you all uh, like that. I think it gives you a different perspective on the food that you commonly eat, as well as sort of sorting out some of the confusion that people have when it comes to certain foods and certain foods that have been demonized. And now you know that you really should, before you hear someone say that you must get rid of X food and Y food, you need to go back and you need to look and say, well, how did the ancients, how did, and sometimes it's just going back to how your grandmother prepared the foods, it might be the answer to be able to incorporate these foods into your diet in a healthy way. So thank you again for uh, your attention. We really did uh, amazingly use up most of the hour. And um, I will be, oh, we have some questions. Let me move my screen over here a little bit. Um, David saying thank you, uh, no problem. I appreciate that. Um, I heard that putting veggies like kale in a blender can be bad for us. So if you're putting raw kale into a blender, there's a couple things that, first of all, it's, it's gonna be a goitrogen because it's not cooked. The second thing is, is that, remember I was talking about how when you crunch on the, um, the vegetable, you get this really potent anti-cancer chemical? Well, if you blend, if you blend it, um, you get so much of it that when you, in, when you ingest it, you are actually going to probably get a little bit sick. So I wouldn't, so when you're eating uh, kale, you, you're better off um, chopping and then cooking. But if you wanna do raw, you could do, you could do raw. The, 
the, the problem with blending kale is you're going to get all of those chemicals in the raw state. And that can be, that can be intense for your stomach, but it also is going to have a lot of goitrogens in it. Um, so uh, what are your thoughts about Dr. Diadamo's blood type diet based on how blood types affect how sensitive we are to lectins in certain foods? So I've, I'm familiar with his diet and I don't have a good answer for you because um, I, do, I, don't really, I don't really completely understand the science behind the diet. So um, I don't really have any kind of opinion on that, unfortunately. I think that um, I know that I was sort of, I, I looked at the list of foods based on his diet for myself and found that, lec that um, I shouldn't eat any lentils. And um, I do think that if I don't prepare lentils properly, I do tend to not feel all that well. So maybe there's something to his diet, but I, I have a little bit of trouble understanding um, the science behind how he came up with, with all that. And I know actually in Asia, they've made suggestions based on blood type for a very long time. And there may be something to it, but I unfortunately can't make a really good educated opinion uh, on his diet. Uh, Christopher is saying, is there any data that takes the food that is high on the Andy score and lets you know what the best way to prepare these foods, how, what the best way to prepare these foods is? I don't know of any, but it's, quite simple, really. Um, first of all, as you probably know, uh, Dr. Furman came up with the Andy score list and his recommendations basically are, are like mine, which are, you need to, for the, probably for the same reasons, which shows you wanna have half raw and half cooked um, so that you get the benefits. But if you're essentially taking kale as an example, you know that um, you're going to want to to cook it uh, based on what we've spoken about here. Now that doesn't mean you can't have a little bit of raw. Again, it's not you don't have to be an absolutist here. You can have a little bit of you can have a small kale salad. I have a small kale salad on occasion. Um, that's fine. Just it's just something that you should be conscious of. So if you're trying to get the highest nutrient density, then you're probably doing you're probably going to have, if it's kale, as an example, you're probably going to have, going to want to have more raw, I'm sorry, more cooked than raw. Um, and the same thing goes with, with a bunch of the other um, cruciferous vegetables, which are sort of at the, at the top of the list. Uh, but I will say that if you want to optimize, I mean, I can essentially tell you, if you want to optimize it, you're going to want to chop it and then cook it. And we're going to want to chop it finely, reasonably, let it sit and then and then cook it without cook it in a broth or in a stew. That's going to by far that's essentially your answer. Basically, that's going to yield the most nutrients. Chopping finely, letting it air for a little while, and then cooking it in a stew so that you don't wash away any any of the nutrients. That by far is there's no question. So anyway, so we we came up with your answer. All right. Um, Vicky is saying, uh, thank you. This is a very comprehensive and informative, informative presentation. I like your philosophy about metabolic flexibility. Um, we spoke about that in, a, in another lecture. Uh, you alluded to something that I believe, in addition to remembering the old ways of preparing food. The food itself has changed. That's true. The food, ha as I mentioned, you know, grains are, wheat is not exactly the same as it was, and potatoes are much bigger than they were hundreds of years ago. And apples evolved from, you know, small little crab apples to giant apples. So the food, food has changed. Um, that's true. But, um, but the processing of the food itself, you know, is of course, as you're pointing out, is, is important to, to remember. Anybody else have any questions? You're welcome, Christopher. And we had a couple other people who came in. I don't know, um, Ruth and Sharon, I don't know how long you, uh, when you came in, but uh, you will get a recording and this will also go up on my YouTube channel uh, tonight after uh, I get the recording. 
Anyone else have any questions? Remarkably, I always start these lectures and I think to myself, with what I've prepared, there's no way we're gonna make an hour. I always think it's gonna last somewhere between 30 and 40 minutes. And because of all your questions and feedback, it's really, really remarkable that we can spend this time together talking. And as I said, you know, all of this is going to be put into book format. And your questions are so important to me because they allow me to, to at least get a brief grasp of how much you understand the information. And then it gives me some feedback on what I need to refine. So I greatly, even though we only had a few questions uh, from Vicki and Christopher, I do greatly appreciate that you, that you had those questions. And I, if has, anyone has any other questions um, before, I, um, before I sign off, please do let me know. I'm just clearing my screen and um, getting things set to close up. Okay, cancel. All right. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, oh, Paul is asking, did you mention pressure cooking? Yes, I did. I mentioned it under when I was discussing uh, beans and lectins. So absolutely, it's very important if you are having trouble digesting beans and you've say given up on beans, which a lot of people have lately, that you try to pressure cook them. And honestly, it actually is a traditional means of preparation. Now, it doesn't go back hundreds of years, but there's no question that there are many people from South America and from Europe. And even, you know, when I talked to my mother, uh, who they always had a pressure cooker at home. And, you know, it's obviously it, for some point in time, it was just an easier way of, of cooking things. But for people from, say, South America, who were used to eating pressure cooked beans, who then come here and, and are not doing pressure cooking, then there is a difference in digestibility. Some people can, can get sick from small amounts of lectins. So, um, and Vicky's saying um, quinoa is another essential item to pressure cook. Yeah, you definitely have to rinse and wash quinoa also uh, because there are uh, what are called saponins, which I didn't mention in the lecture, which I suppose I could have, but it's basically like a soap-like particle that coats seeds. Um, and that's another, and that can cause gut irritation. And so you can get that in quinoa as well. So, um, and quinoa is essentially a seed. So you wanna treat it as if it's a seed, which means um, soaking, heating, pressure cooking, all of these things are gonna make it and render it more digestible. So thank you, Vicki, for bringing that up. And thank you, Paula, for, um, for, for mentioning that. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, well, thank you again. Um, and I believe we'll have another lecture next Wednesday. So thank you all, especially those people who are coming every week. I do appreciate it. And I, as I said, I do appreciate all the comments and, and your attention for the, for the full hour. So everyone have a great night. And again, thank you so much for, for your attention.